So someone who really populated this idea of the ego in our Western society, or at least in the, in the last couple of years, was Eckhart Tolle, who wrote the book, The Power of Now. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it or read it. And he talks about the ego. And of course, he didn't make up this whole concept of the ego. This goes very, very long back and is based on old spiritual traditions, um, you know, Eastern philosophy, um, Buddhism and stuff like that. So it's nothing new, but I do believe that it is surrounded by quite some misconception and it is very reductionistic how a lot of people approach this idea of the ego. So I want to just share some of my thoughts here, some of my ideas that hopefully contribute to clarifying this whole idea of the ego, how we can view it maybe in a, in a bit of a less reductionistic and oversimplifying way. So the general idea or concept of the ego is that the ego is created by our thoughts. So whenever we think, our thinking mind, that is basically the ego. And it's not really who we are. It's not who we really are, right? Because our thoughts aren't real. So the idea is that we're basically all um, part of this universal consciousness. We are all essentially coming from the Big Bang, you know, this energy that the Big Bang set free. We are all part of this primal energy, this primal consciousness. And our thoughts, our ego, our thinking mind gives us the feeling or the idea that we are somehow separate of this, that we are separate from the world, that we are separate from other people and, you know, separate from this primal universal energy. So that's, you know, basically more or less in an oversimplified way how most modern spiritual teachers um, view and approach the ego. And now what's interesting for me is that there are a lot of different views also on the ego. So, for example, Freud was also talking about the ego. So in psychology and in psychotherapy, people have also used this term ego but to describe something slightly different. So Freud talked about the superego, the ego, and the id. So the superego basically um, are all the values that we have introjected from our society, from teachers, from authorities, from our parents. So it's like our superficial layer of values and beliefs, how we ought to be, how we ought to behave, okay? So it's like this socially conditioned part of who we are. And then the ego, according to Freud, is our main consciousness. It's what allows us to navigate and um, live according to the superego and the id, so basically, the ego allows us to communicate between the super ego and the id. And the id is our basic human drives, right? It's our subconscious drives, our instincts, and like more or less our animalistic parts, okay? And again, the ego, according to Freud, allows us to consciously find a dialogue between the id and the super ego between our socially conditioned um, values and how we think we should behave and the id, our actual drives, our subconscious um, drives and instincts. And oftentimes, according to Freud, when there's a incongruity between the super ego and the id, then we can, we can have serious neurotic problems, you know, develop schizophrenia or neurosis and stuff like that. 
So it's interesting how the same word is used in a different way. And if we look at the ego in this more psychological way, in this less spiritual way, then the ego is something that we need. And also Krishnamurti talked about the ego and he actually uses the, the term functional ego to describe the part of the ego, the part of our consciousness, of our thoughts, of our thinking mind, which we need to be able to function properly in the world. So we do need our thoughts. We do need a thinking mind. We do need consciousness in order to to um you know live our day-to-day -day life so there is a functional ego that we need and i think that's a very important thing to point that out that the ego isn't just something bad because in the last years or in in these oversimplifying spiritual teachings the ego is usually presented as something evil it's like the root of all evil our thoughts they create all these negative emotions and, you know, they create all the wars and all the tension in the world. It's our thoughts. And if we can just shut down or calm down our thinking mind and our ego, then everything will be okay. And what I'm trying to point out here is that this view of the world is quite oversimplifying and it isn't congruent with what psychologists, um, psychological research and also empirical experience from working with people in psychotherapy or in, in group works or individual work, uh, it's not really congruent with that. So although we are connected to this Big Bang energy, to this universal energy, however you want to call it, you can call it God, a lot of people call it God, others call it essence or, you know, just the universe or whatever you want to call it. So it is true that that's where we essentially come from. We all come from that same source. But what happens, what I believe what happens is, in the process, when we get born, actually we form an ego. So from this universal energy, a part of that energy splits off and we form an ego, we form an identity. You know, we get born, we get socialized, and from that universal universal energy and essence, we split off part of that energy that then becomes an ego, that becomes us. So, to a human being, there's more than just this essence and this energy, this universal source, and there's also more to a human being than just the ego. So, people who deny the ego are oversimplifying and reductionistic in my opinion and also people who say that there is no connectedness there is no source there is no energy and essence so i believe what makes a human being really human is a balance between this source energy this being connected with everything with the universe with the world with other people that we all come from the same place um, that makes a human being human, but also his unique qualities, his unique experience. What makes me, me, and what makes you, you, is something very unique and different, okay? We aren't the same, although we have, and we come from the same energy, from the universe, from whatever you want to call it. We still have developed different egos, different selves from that and I think that's very very important to also acknowledge that and to see that the ego isn't the root of all evil it's not there is a functional ego that we mean that uh, sorry that we need and if we are totally cut off from that then we don't really function properly and in this whole topic of the ego there's also something else that is very important and that's the whole idea of meditation so meditation is like the practice of making your mind still 
of calming down your thoughts so you can go beyond your ego and connect yourself with this source energy. And now again, there is a misconception in regards to meditation because a lot of people, they confuse being present with having no thoughts. And I would argue that if you have no thoughts, it doesn't mean at all that you are present. You can have no thoughts at all. You can be out of your head, but you can still not be present because real presence is whole body presence. You can't be present unless you're present in your body. So a lot of people who try to deal with their ego by meditating and all they do is just not think and calm their minds. What they don't realize is that that's just the peak of the iceberg. That ego, those thoughts, those conscious thoughts, that's just the peak of the iceberg. And beneath the consciousness, there's the whole world of the unconscious. And that is basically in our body. What is the unconscious? It's our body. It's our nervous system, right? So if someone has had tra traumatic experiences in their life or they have repelled emotions, they have emotional baggage that they're carrying with them and they don't resolve that and all they do is just meditate and they, they don't think but they don't find a way to deal with the emotional baggage that's in their body, manifested in their body, in their muscular tissue. And all they do is just deal with their, their thoughts. They're being far from, from being present, right? Because they don't have whole body presence. All that they're doing is they are getting rid of their thoughts, but they're not resolving the emotional issues that are actually underlying that that are like the part of the iceberg that's under the water right so you can sit there meditating um being totally calm in your mind but still in your body you have all these traumatic experiences in your muscular tissue and you're essentially living in the past right although you're mind is calm, you're living in the past. You're living in the past because your body is remembering all these past experiences. So it doesn't really matter if you're turning off that switch in your mind and being quiet because in your body, in your muscles, in your tissue, you still have all that body memory. Okay. So real presence always has to be embodied. You want to strive for whole body presence because if your presence, if your meditation isn't grounded, then sometimes it can even have a negative effect because if you aren't in your body with your consciousness, if you aren't aware of your body and you don't make room for those past emotions and trapped emotions and unresolved uh, experiences that are essentially living in your body without you realizing it. If you don't deal with that, if you don't have any body awareness and body presence and your awareness stops basically where your shoulders start, then if you get rid of your thoughts by meditating, then you are nowhere at all, right? If you're not in your body and not in your mind, you're just spacing out. You are nowhere. And for many people, that can actually have a negative effect. So there have been many, many um, accounts of people in spiritual movements, for example, in the Osho movement, uh, Rajneesh movement, where people were pushed beyond their limits and also meditated and, and, and used this spiritual concept in a way where it wasn't really grounded, it wasn't really connected to the body and to their feelings. So a lot of people actually went psychotic in these movements. So for example, 
uh, from what I've heard from people who have studied with Osho, um, they had actually a full employee to bring people back who went psychotic, to bring them into psychiatric hospitals, to, to bring them back home and into those hospitals, because it wasn't uncommon for people to sometimes space out, uh, go psychotic and totally lose it. So what I would suggest is that if you're interested in all these concepts, you know, ego, meditation and presence, it is very important that you come from a grounded approach, that you embody this presence so that you, com that you can combine this source energy also with who you are, with your ego, because it's not something bad, right? If you can use your consciousness, your awareness, and expand it to feel your entire body and to be more grounded in this body, in this flesh and blood that has manifested itself from this source energy, if you can be more of that, be more grounded in that, then you can also start to connect more with that spiritual energy with that source energy, okay? But you don't only want to do that. If you're totally ungrounded, disconnected from your body, you're cutting off your feelings and all the emotional things that are going on in your body, all the emotional baggage that you have from the past, if you cut that off, if you're not aware of it and ungrounded, and then you try to connect to that source energy you can totally space out. Again, if you're not in your head and not in your body, you are nowhere. Where are you? You're outside of yourself. And that is not something that will contribute to your happiness and to your mental health and to actually being more connected to that source. So there are many people who are spiritually ungrounded. Many people who don't embody their spirituality and their presence become, they're ungrounded and they, they kind of space out, right? Sometimes people make fun of these people. It's like these, these you know, new age uh, hippie people who believe in angels and all these energies. And, you know, that's fine if it comes from a grounded approach, if it comes from, from a, if it's connected in some form with who you really are and with your body. But... Sometimes, you know, people take this to absurd levels because it's so ungrounded. They've totally lost the connection to themselves, to their body, right? And being human means to acknowledge your body, to feel yourself, to feel at home in your um, bones and flesh. And people who lost that connection oftentimes drift off into spiritual illusions, into these near psychotic mental states, which aren't helping them at all. Because again, it's ungrounded, it's disconnected, and it's out of contact. So what do you want to do is, you want to, first of all, that's my suggestion. You can take it or you can leave it. But what I would suggest is that you get rid of these oversimplifying ideas of the self and the ego. Get rid of this, you know, reductionistic idea that the ego is just your thoughts. And also get rid of the idea that it's just your thoughts that create your emotions. That's also something that isn't true. Of course, your thoughts create your emotions, but then there's also cases where you can have emotions without actually thinking at all, right? You can pick up emotions. For example, before you even have consciousness, that's like the whole pioneering research from uh, prenatal psychology, where they found out that babies before they're even born, can actually have traumatic experiences, before they actually have 
an identity, before they have what we call an ego in that sense, before they have um, thoughts, conscious thoughts in the way that we have as adults, before they even have that, they can have emotional traumas. All of that has an immense impact on our emotions. So it's not just our thoughts that causes our emotions. So vice versa, it's not just getting rid of our thoughts that will resolve our emotions, right? And that's one of the big misconceptions that, oh, if our emotions are just created by our thoughts, then it must be that if we stop thinking, we stop having all these emotional problems, right? All these negative emotions. And that's a problem because first of all, the way to deal with emotions isn't to get rid of them, right? So if you are trying to meditate to get rid of your negative emotions, you are escaping from how you're feeling, you're cutting off from how you're really feeling, and you are repelling your emotions and your feelings instead of integrating them. So that in itself, from a therapeutic, psychotherapeutic standpoint, can be a problem. And then second of all, the idea is problematic that it's just your thoughts that create all these emotions. So if you could just turn off all the mental chatter, then your emotions would resolve themselves. And, you know, you know, it has an effect. There is, of course, an effect from your thoughts on your emotions, a big one. But also, you have to realize that your emotions are embodied. So, no matter what you're thinking, those emotions, they live in your body. They're in your tissue. It's what we call body memory. So, to actually resolve those emotions, those negative emotions or those traumas, you have to work through them by using the body. That's why body psychotherapy is so effective to deal with emotions and with trauma because they don't just acknowledge the mind and the, the thoughts and work with talking to people and helping them have more positive thoughts. But in body psychotherapy, the whole body is used to express those emotions, to integrate those emotions and then they can be resolved. And then oftentimes, that has a positive influence on the thoughts a person has. So emotions and thoughts are connected in both ways. We call this bottom-up, uh, top-down, bottom-up in uh, psychotherapy. So bottom-up means working with the body, you know, being in your body, and dealing with those emotions and, th and that trauma that you have in your body will help you have more positive thoughts. It'll change your mindset. It'll change your beliefs. It'll clear up the mental fog that you have going on in your mind. That's what we call bottom up. Top down is the other direction. Clearing up the mental fog in your mind or, you know, dealing with your thoughts, being more positive reframing things can have a downwards effect on your autonomous nervous system, on your body basically. So it's not as simple as you read and you, you are being taught in, in some of these spiritual books, you know, just get rid of your thoughts, calm down your mind and all your problems are solved. You know, just get rid of your ego and everything will be fine. It's not that simple. And I hope that through these, um, through this little talk here that I was able to, to show the complexity of this. I'm a big fan of keeping things simple most of the time, but when things are being oversimplified and reduced to a level where it can even harm people, then I think it's important to use somewhat con um, complex language to, to talk about this stuff. So I hope I didn't confuse you even more. Um, if you take anything from this, 
then that your presence should always be whole body presence. So if you want to, you know, have a practical tip how to do this, there is something that I call body energy, uh, sorry, body impulse listening, um, where you sit down when you meditate and instead of just trying to not think, you become aware of your body energies and your body impulses, right? And this takes some degree of body awareness, right? So you can see how much are you in your body? Do you even realize that you have a body? Or does your, do your feelings and your awareness stop right beneath your neck, right? For many people, if you tell them, <laughs> dude, you have a body, they don't even realize. Of course, they know they have a body. They know it, right? Because they read it in some biology book, but they don't really feel that body. They're disconnected with their own body and with that whole inner world that's going on in that body. So when you tell them, how do you feel in your body? They kind of laugh at you or they smile because for them, they can't relate to that because they're so stuck in their head, right? So I think what you can take from this is that you should make sure that spirituality isn't ungrounding you even more and making you even more stuck in your head. So you want to have a grounded approach to spirituality, a grounded approach and an embodied approach to presence and an embodied form of meditating. So things you can do practically, for example, is um, body scan meditations that'll rise your bodily, bodily awareness. You can do this body impulse listening where you do like a sort of body scan meditation, but you also become aware of your impulses. So you, you listen to your body's impulses. You see, what does my body want to do right now? You know, do you want to make a fist? Does your hand want to make a fist? Do you want to jump up and shake your body? Uh, do you want to roll on the floor? Do you want to make a handstand? What does your body need? What is your body's impulse, right? And that's part of body presence, to be in touch with those impulses, to give your body what it needs. And that'll make your meditation sessions, if you can put this into practice, a lot more embodied and grounded. So you can find and connect yourself with that source energy, with that essence that everyone's looking for, that spiritual energy, that connectedness, co connectedness with the universe. But at the same time, you're also here and now in your body. Okay, presence means being here and now in your body, being at home in your body. So presence requires both. It requires an ego, requires that you accept your flesh that you are. And also accept that you are something that goes beyond that flesh, that you are something greater, something deeper than just the flesh, that you're also a soul in that body that comes from a source that is universal. And then you can really connect it. You can connect the mind and the body. And it's like yin and yang. You have the balance. And if you can do it in a way like this, then your spirituality, your meditation and your presence will greatly benefit you and contribute to your well-being and to your experience as a human being on this planet.